Welcome to Dr. Lottie's Science with Soul. I am Dr. Lottie and the host of this podcast. Today, I'm excited to introduce Jeffrey Olson. Olson is a best-selling author who inspires audiences internationally with his intriguing story of perseverance and inner strength. After a horrific automobile accident took the lives of his wife and youngest son, also inflicting multiple life-threatening injuries to Jeff, including the amputation of his left leg, he found the courage to survive over 18 surgeries and eventually heal both physically and emotionally. At the time of his accident, Olson had incredible out-of-body near-death experiences, bringing him insights not common in today's world. Jeff has integrated these experiences with many healing modalities and now shares those with others as he works to bring forth awareness, healing, and oneness. Olson's latest book, Knowing, is a compilation of his earlier books with even deeper insights and extended chapters. Knowing can be, can be found on Amazon in all different formats. Among Jeff's many accomplishments, he is most fulfilled by simply being a husband, a father, and a friend. So welcome, Jeff. It's an honor to have you as a guest today. Oh, thank you, Dr. Lottie. It's so good to be with you. Thank you. So I know about your near-death experience and the accident, and it's a fascinating story um, that what you experienced, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell the listeners yet because I want you to share the story with them, but can you tell us what happened about this car accident and your near-death experience? Yeah, I, I would be happy to. And I think it's important to point out that this happened 24 years ago. Um, I, I, I couldn't even speak of this for almost a decade. It was too painful. It was too personal. But now I'm, I'm in a place where I can speak openly about it and we can recount what happened. Now, some of the details I had to go to doctors and my brothers and family <clears throat> to get the details of. But the near-death experience and the, the spiritual parts of the story are, are like they happened yesterday. Um, it, it, it is always uh, so fresh in my consciousness. But, um, but yeah, it was a horrible automobile accident. The whole family was in the car and uh, it was a road trip. We had traveled to Southern Utah to the Red Rock you know, country and it was the Easter weekend actually. We had visited my wife's family and Monday morning had come and it was time to come home. And uh, I'll never forget that. You know, hindsight is an interesting thing, but there was a particular moment. And I, I speak a lot about moments. Um, we had said our goodbyes. We had hugged everybody. We were in the car. I buckled the kids in their car seats and we were getting ready just to pull away from the curb to, to go. And my wife, Tamara, stopped me. She said, stop, wait. And, and I thought she had forgotten something. And, and um, I stopped the car. And she said, I just want to go say goodbye to mom and dad one more time. And I, I bring that up because there, there was some whisper. There was some idea. There was some thought. She said, stop, wait. I'm going to go do this. And I, I watched as she got out of the car. And her mom and dad were on the porch, you know, grandma and grandpa were waving the way they do. And she ran up and I watched as she not only hugged them each, but she kissed them. And, and I, I noticed that, which, you know, in the normal turn of events, that wouldn't have been an odd thing, but I noticed it. And it's the way the day played out that I realized that was the last goodbye. Uh, she came running back to the car, jumped in, buckled up, and away we went. Um, I was heading up the interstate. You know, I had the cruise control set at 75 miles an hour. And it was, um, you know, probably about an hour and a half or so after that, that, uh, that, um, that the accident happened. Now it's, it's difficult to talk about even after this time, there was reports of heavy crosswinds. There was reports of a 
red pickup truck that was driving erratically on the interstate. I, I don't remember any of that. I do remember the winds. One of the most difficult parts of the story is I, I believe I may have just, just nodded off, just dozed off for a, a moment. And in doing so, I swerved to the right, I overcorrected to the left, and I lost control of the car, and the car began to roll, not off the road, but down the road, down the concrete propelled at that 75 miles an hour. It was a horrific uh, automobile accident. And uh, I blacked out for most of that. But when the car came to a stop, I was completely conscious. And the first thing I heard was my seven-year-old son crying in the back seat. But it was that cry a father knows. It's like, oh, I've got to get to my son. He's okay, but I've got to get to him. And that's when I realized that I could not move. Um, I was pinned either to the floorboard or to the seat. I couldn't tell. There was the rancid smell of gasoline, the broken glass. Um, I had no idea of my injuries. Uh, I knew I was in pain. I knew I was struggling to breathe. What had actually happened is both of my legs had been crushed and shattered. Uh, the left leg was eventually amputated above the knee. My back had been damaged. My rib cage was damaged. My lungs were collapsing. My right arm had almost been torn completely off and then the seatbelt had cut through my intestines and ruptured all my insides. I, I was an absolute physical mess. I was not aware of my injuries. I just knew my son was crying and wanted to get to him, but I became very aware in that moment that no one else was crying. And, and I knew at the scene, I was aware at the scene that my wife and my youngest son had both been killed instantly in the accident. And um, that's probably the darkest place a man can be. I mean, half the family's gone. I've got a hysterical seven-year-old. I'm pinned, I can't move, I'm losing consciousness. And, and I was driving the car. I mean, the, 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 the regret, the, the, the guilt, it's like, can't I get those two seconds back and um, it was in that dark, dark space that, that an interesting thing happened. As I struggled to maintain consciousness, suddenly light came. And, and, I, and it felt as if light came to me, like light came and surrounded me. It was tangible. And I began to rise above the scene of the accident. I felt a lift, I felt a rise, and suddenly I was fine. I could breathe, there was no pain. <laughs> and I was actually wondering, how can I possibly be okay? How can I possibly be okay? And in that light, my wife, who I knew was deceased at the scene, she was suddenly in that light with me. And I found that interesting too because she was gorgeous so there was no injuries she was beautiful and yet she was emphatic that I could not stay she she kept saying Jeff you've got to go you've got to go you can't come you've got to go back and uh, we had a very poignant conversation um, and I learned a lot about choice in those moments because there I was looking at the woman I loved more than life but I knew I had a little boy in the back seat of that car that was going to be okay. And, and we made a choice. We, we discussed and I chose to come back. And um, we have no idea how powerful our thoughts are. You know, in, in making that choice, I didn't have to figure out, well, how am I gonna get back? I, it was merely the intention, like I'm going back. And I said the most profound goodbye I'll ever say um, and I found myself wandering about a hospital, moving freely about a hospital. Now, I have no concept of time in this bubble of light, if you will. I, I later found out that people arrived at the scene. Uh, one happened to be a doctor who was able to see the Spencer, my seven-year-old, who was banged up a little bit, but he basically physically walked away. Emotionally, he thought the whole family was gone. Uh, I had to be extricated from the car, and I was then airlifted or life-flighted to the nearest level one trauma center. 
I, I knew none of that. I knew I had crashed the car. I knew I'd said a profound goodbye. I'd made the choice to come back and here was my soul wandering through this hospital, encountering the doctors, the patients, the nurses, the families of the patients, everything in a busy level one trauma center. And, um, and yet I was encountering these people in such a profound way. Um, I, I knew them perfectly. I, I knew everything about them. I knew their love, their hate, their joy, their motivations. I, it, I call it the oneness. I, there was such a connection, such a connection. I, I was them and they were me. I mean, I was, it was so um, connected. I, I, the, the words are sometimes difficult, but I was so connected. I was experiencing them as if they were me and I was them. And uh, I finally came up on a body or a man I didn't feel anything from, which was odd based on what I was experiencing. And that's when I stepped closer and realized, oh my gosh, that's, that's me or that's my body. Uh, it wasn't me. I was having this profound connected experience, but there was my body that was so broken, uh, so broken. And yet I knew I had to get back in. And um, that was a choice too. I've learned everything's a choice. And uh, you know, there's, there's an interesting aspect of, of my experience that is unique. And that is one of the uh, doctors, one of the level one trauma doctors and one of the nurses had an interesting experience around this too. Dr. Jeff O'Driscoll speaks of his shared death experience you know, we had never met, we didn't know each other, but here I was coming back into the body. And he shares that he experienced my wife who was killed at the scene of the accident. He experienced her spirit in the operating room. He says he saw her and she communicated with him. And, um, you know, he's written a book called Not Yet, which uh, outlines that, but it was unique that here, not only the doctor, but one of the nurses had a profound and shared death experience in the ER room as I was basically coming back and entering back into my body. And yet in getting back in the body, back to the pain, um, the trauma, you know, the grief, the guilt, the, I mean, it was so difficult to go back into the body. And, um, you know, I was ventilated. There was a big tube down my throat doing all the breathing for my lungs. Uh, my legs were obviously crushed and immobile. My right arm had been torn out so badly it was immobile. And then eventually they tied down my left hand because I kept grabbing at all the medical equipment. And I was, uh, and I was back. But, but it's almost like the door never closed completely. I mean, I, I, I spent almost six months in the hospital. I had 18 surgeries in total, uh, you know, putting and piecing me back together. And, um, and yet it's almost like I had one foot in this realm and one foot in the next. I had profound dreams and uh, interactions. Um, my, my wife who was killed at the scene continued to be a part of that experience in a very profound way. And, um, it was, um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot in the hospital. You're, yeah, I don't know what kind of a doctor you are, Dr. Roddy. You, you, I don't know if you're a medical doctor or, or what your background is, but uh, you can imagine the injuries and what mm -hmm. went on. Uh, yes, I am a medical doctor. I'm a family practitioner. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. And so here you are in the hospital and how, you were there for months and yeah. you had 18 surgeries yeah once you were once they released you what condition were you in at that time well it's interesting i was released in a wheelchair um you know the amputation was still healing in fact i had horrific infections in the amputation i had horrific infections throughout my whole body just based on the rupturing of the intestines and they had, had to leave my abdomen open for for uh, weeks if not months you know packing it and trying to deal with the infections but i left in a wheelchair with my left leg amputated my right leg was in a brace because they had attempted to repair the right knee it still has six pins and a plate in it 
my right arm was in a sling, you know, because they had done the work to reattach the rotator cuff and they were attempting to get the nerves to regenerate into those muscles so I could maintain some movement of the arm. And I had a colostomy bag based on the rupturing of the intestines. So I, I was quite a sight uh, going home from the hospital. And I think perhaps the most profound near-death experience may have been at the end of my hospital stay. I mean, I had been in ICU and I would go you know, into surgical recovery, then back into ICU. I threw not one, but two uh, pulmonary emboli, the, the blood clots that lodge in your lungs. And so I would be back in ICU and uh, there was all kinds of issues, but I finally got out of ICU. I got through surgical recovery. I went through the whole process. I was in the rehabilitation room in this state of you know, attempting to learn how to operate this little electric wheelchair. And it still took nurses and family to lift me into it. I couldn't transfer given the state of my limbs and all. But the most profound thing may have happened at the end of my hospital stay. And um, I was finally able to sleep on my side. They'd finally stabilized my abdomen and put the colostomy on and all that stuff. And uh, I, I was able to lay on my side, you know, and I had laid so long on the back of my head, the back of my head was bald. My brothers were giving me a bad time about that, but I had this profound night where I, I went to sleep. I rolled on my side and I naturally sleep on my side. And it was some of the first times I've been able to roll on my side. And I fell into a deep sleep and I felt that light come again. I felt that light like at the scene of the accident come and I, I seemed to be rising above the hospital bed. And this time the light dispensed, it went away. And I was in the most incredible place. Um, you know, people say heaven, they say the spirit world, they say the other side. The only word I can use that comes close to what I was experiencing is I was home. I was home, it was so welcoming, so familiar, so I, I was home and uh, I began to run. I, I, and, and you know, I, I, I can't stress how physical the experience was. I was running, but it was so sensory. Like I could, I, could, I, I was experiencing the energy of the ground beneath my feet and I was experiencing the intelligence in my toes and in my calves and in my thighs. And I was, I was running thinking I'm home, I'm home. And, and, and then I got the message I wasn't there to stay. And about that same time, I noticed this corridor off to my left and I, I knew intuitively I'm to go that way. And I began to make my way down the corridor. And as I made my way down at the end of the corridor was a crib. Now, my youngest son who was also killed in the accident he had been sleeping in a crib. He was only 14 months old at the time of the accident. He was just a toddler. And, and so I, I intuitively raced to this crib. And when I looked in there, there was my little boy and he was perfect. He was sleeping beautifully. And, and I picked him up. I, I picked him up and I, I don't know if you've ever picked up a sleeping child, but there's a, a weight and a heat to it. And, and I pick, I mean, it was so, it was so, real it was so physical i i held him against me and he was solid against me and I, I even wondered how can i be experiencing this at such a super physical level and, and i i leaned over and i smelled his hair um, I, I don't know if you've ever smelled the hair of a loved one but it was it's like it's him it's really him i mean everything i was doing it was so real and it was him and i i began to weep just holding my little boy and as I did, I felt this presence coming up behind me, this overwhelming presence. It was so big and, and powerful and wise and cosmic. And, and I began to be fearful. I, my thought was, that's, that's God. That's God. And I had grown up in a conservative Christian home. And I thought, wow, I'm, well, the guilt came up. You know, I, I thought my, my, my child is here because I crashed the car. Uh, his life was cut short because I lost control and, and here comes God and I'm in so much trouble. I mean, I it was fearful, the guilt. And 
as the presence came closer and closer and I'm holding my little boy and weeping, the presence came so close and I, I had this thought, oh, I, I hope I can be forgiven. I hope I can be forgiven. And in that thought, suddenly, and this felt, this felt almost physical too, these divine arms just wrapped around and held us, held me and my, and my child. And, and there was so much unconditional love. And when I say unconditional, I mean, it was just this outpouring of, of love. And um, this thought I had of, I hope I can be forgiven. The first thought that flowed back to me from this divine source was there's nothing to forgive. Everything's in divine order. And, and then of course, you know, I had the life review as they call it. I, I began to see my life and I saw the things where I said, oh, that was a mistake and I didn't mean to do that. And, and yet the communication was there are no mistakes. What did you learn from it? And, and I saw things and thought, well, that was wrong. And I knew it was wrong and I did it anyway. And, and it was so beautiful. The communication from this divine creator was that's your judgment of it, not, not ours. We love you. And, and when I say that, I mean, I can't, it, it was this multiplicity. Here I was holding my own child who, who to me was perfect and profound and beloved. And yet being in the arms of God and having that communicated that you are as beloved, as perfect, as divine to us as the child you hold. And it was a very personal experience. But I also realized this rippled out to every single one of us. I mean, this, this love, this unconditional love that we were all, everyone, that beloved, that known, that, that connected. Um, and, and of course, there was choice again, you know, I mean, it was communicated that I could be mad at God my whole life because this happened. Or I could beat myself up and blame myself my whole life because I was driving the car. But in this profound peace, I, I was also told, or you can exercise your will. Now, you know, here's, here's, the creator is saying, I can exercise my will. And my upbringing, I, I, you know, I said, I thought your will be done. And it was so beautiful because what was communicated is your will is my will. That's how much we love you. Your, your will has always been my will. My will has always been that you're free to choose. And I'm inviting you to exercise your will. You can give your son to me. You can hand him over. You can trust and let go and exercise your will in this circumstance and not have to feel like you have no choice. And in all that peace and in all that love, I was able to kiss my little boy and, and hand him over. And, and then I came to myself or I returned to my body. I returned to the hospital and the amputation and all the injuries and the wheelchair and and all of those things, but that was, it was so profound. And I don't want anyone to think that I had the accident and I had this profound experience and I was okay. That's not true. I had a horrible accident. I had absolutely profound experiences and then I, I grieved like anyone else would grieve. Um, there was long months and years of healing, but I did have that different perspective. So when you then later got released and you got sent home, yeah. your son was was just a seven year old. So did he stay with your family during that time? Yeah, he did. He he stayed with my younger brother, and either of my brothers would have taken him in just like their own. But he had a little cousin that was the same age at my younger brother's house, and they were very close. And so he stayed with them. And, and I actually, when I was released to go home, I had to go to my brother's house. I wasn't ready to go home. I mean, they had to clear out a room and put a hospital bed in the house. And there was still doctors coming in and rehabilitation people. And, you know, I had home health for some time in his house. But, but going home was, was profound, going home to his house. I mean, Spencer, my seven-year-old, he had seen me in the hospital. Um, you know, when I was well enough for him to visit, he'd come to visit in the hospital, but going home 
I, I was so worried about him. I thought, how's he going to deal with this? I mean, he's lost everything I lost. And, uh, you know, how, how are we going to deal on his turf? It, it was interesting. And my brothers, who I can't say enough about, they about lost their jobs to come and take care of me and sit with me. And they were there the day I was to come home. And they, they lifted me into my wheelchair and got me in the car and loaded up the wheelchair and, you know, began the trek home. And as we, as we came to the house, it, it was interesting. They built a ramp. You know, they were emphatic that I learned to be independent. They were going to make me drive that wheelchair and get in the house. But as, as we drove up, I saw Spencer looking out the window. He was watching, you know, as, as my brothers, his uncles, lifted me into the wheelchair, his dad. And he came running out as I kind of got in the chair and headed toward the ramp. He came running out, but he ran toward me and he ran right, right past me. And I thought, I know, I know this is hard. I knew this was going to be dramatic. I mean, here's the colostomy bag, you know, hanging off my belly and my arms all in a sling and the left legs cut off. And suddenly I was there like it wasn't in the hospital. I was, I was there in, in, in reality, like there he was looking at me. And I thought, that's just, that's just too much for a little boy. And, um, you know, I, I began to work my way toward the ramp to go in the house and as I turned the chair, I just looked to see where he was. And what he had actually done is he had run across the street and he was knocking on all the neighbor's doors. And he was shouting, come out, come out. My dad has made it home, come see my dad. And uh, I, I share this for a specific reason. I mean, I, I, I realized, wow, my judgments of myself are not his. And after he had done that, he did run and he threw himself on my lap, which just about killed me because I still had all the sutures, you know, from the, from the abdominal repair and all that had gone on. And, and I held him and, I, you know, I said, look, I'm going to work really hard to get well, but it's going to be like this for a while. Are you going to be okay with this? And we, we still laugh. He's a grown man now, but he said to me, he said, dad, if you were nothing but a puddle of blood, I would still love you. And I, I just burst into tears. Um, but here, here's why I share this, is this, this was also a profound awakening. Here I was in a wheelchair, holding my surviving son in this realm. And suddenly that was no less divine than holding my son who had passed in the other realm in the, in the arms of God. I mean, suddenly heaven was right here. That, that, you know, that was, there was nowhere to go. There was nothing to become. It was simply to be in that perfect moment and feel the unconditional love of a child which was every bit as profound as the unconditional love of God I mean it was it was it was this beautiful epiphany that wow maybe maybe heaven's right here if I choose to experience it that way did you have beliefs that the soul can leave the body before you're in the death experience Oh, I, I, I did. I mean, I grew up, like I say, in a, in a, you know, a conservative Christian home. We were believers, and I believed that there was death and that you would live after death, but that God would judge you, and life was a test, and I was probably failing, right? Um, so none of that was new to me. The interesting thing, at the accident scene, when I left the body, I did kind of think, well, what's, what's happening? What's going on here? Um, and yet it was a beautiful thing. Uh, many many may say I, I had a very violent, you know, tumultuous death, if you will. But gosh, the, the, the passing, you know, that, that, that going into that light was as natural and beautiful as anything. Um, but then the experience at the end of the hospital stay where I'm running around, you know, it, it was more profound than anything I had conjured up in my, what, my belief? of what uh, heaven or the other side might be like. And, and so it, it's one thing to believe or have theologies around it. It's another thing to experience it. And it kind of turned my belief inside out and upside down. I was experiencing the unconditional love of a God that I had believed was judgmental and, and had great expectations for what I should be, <laughs> you know? And that was not what I experienced. And then when, when you were at home and now you're recovering, did you have other experiences where you would meet your wife or hear your wife? 
Well, I, I did, but not all the time. In fact, it was very lonely. Oh, I grieved miserably once I got home and healing. And I was so focused on getting better. I getting back to work and, and I was eventually fit with a prosthetic limb and, and, and learning to walk and raising my son as a single parent. And, you know, I, I mean, my family was so supportive and I, I hired a nanny that would come in and work with Spencer and his homework and start dinner. And, and, um, and yet those were very lonely months. In fact, I often wondered where, where is that connection? Where's that love? Where's that the dreams or the visions, what, you know, what, how am I so alone um, in this scenario? And, and, and it's interesting because as time rolled on, I mean, I eventually got back to work, I learned to walk and there was angels. I mean, sometimes the angels were my brothers, sometimes it was a neighbor or my mom, but you know, there was an incredible thing that happened. Um, Tanya, my current wife, she came into my life and I wasn't dating. I wasn't looking. She, it was a business meeting that I, I connected. And, and that was an incredible thing because that was almost profound. There was a spiritual knowing about that. I didn't know her. I had never met her. And yet there she was. And, and, you know, she moved away to Arizona. We were kind of pen pals and I opened up to her and was sharing. And yet, you know, we would see each other and she would visit and we would, write emails back and forth and have telephone conversations. But I realized, I realized I was falling in love with her. And that, and that, I felt guilty about that. I think I have a guilt complex because I felt bad about that. And I, I remember ending up at my wife who had passed my first wife's grave. And I'm, I'm crying on her grave and I'm angry. I'm like, how dare you? You left, you know, you're in that beautiful place and I'm here limping and attempting to raise our son. And, and as I poured my heart out, um, her feeling so gone, I swear she came. She came to me. I felt her stand behind me as I'm hunched over sobbing in the grass. And I felt her hands on my shoulders and she began to communicate. So this was where, you know, yeah, I mean, she wasn't that gone. And, and she said to me, she said, don't berate me. I loved you enough to go. And I thought you loved me enough to go. That doesn't make any sense. And, and, and here's the interesting communication. She's like, look, you, you've forgotten, but we had an agreement. I, I would have loved nothing more than to stay and grow old with you, but your soul had a journey. And I loved you enough to leave that you would have the experience you came to have, that your soul would be expanded, that your heart would be broken and opened. And, I, and I mean, it was very profound in hindsight. Now it was so um, beautiful and meaningful. Uh, she actually said I held her in my grief, that she was still connected. She could only be as happy as I was. And she begged me to choose joy. And of course, I shared at that time. I said, look, I'm having feelings for another woman. And, and she, she actually laughed at me. And she said, of course you are. Of course you are. I, I, know, I know all of this. In fact, I... I put Tanya in your path. She communicated very crystal clear that, that this was a good woman that would teach me unconditional love. And, and, you know, I mean, here was this, what, this profound visitation, this conversation. And she even shared that I was a pretty good dad, but I was a lousy mother. And our, and our little boy deserved a mom. And, and we, again, we had this conversation. So yes, in profound moments, of my life even, and, and you'll find it in knowing. If you get the book and read the stories, I mean, Spencer growing up and all that went on and even to him eventually finding love and marrying and, you know, it, it's, 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 quite, it's quite a memoir of, of life, but in these key moments, yeah, that, that, that veil, if you will, opens up and I would have a dream or have a vision like this and, and key things were communicated. Tanya and I eventually did get married. We adopted two sons and we don't even call them our adopted. They're just our sons. They just came a different way. And, and life has played out in a beautiful, profound, powerful way. And yet it, it still has all the challenges that every, anyone has. I mean, it, you know, but, but yeah, there, there have, I've got guardian angels. That's the best way to put it. I've got two guardian angels that have never really stopped looking out for me. 
Wow, it is such an amazing journey that you've had and all the different out-of-body experiences, the near-death experiences, the shared near-death experience, and then your whole journey to go through 18 surgeries and heal physically and emotionally and to carry on with your life and, and remarry and adopting two more children. I mean, it's just a beautiful story. And I know you have written three books, but the last one, the book that you just mentioned, Knowing, can you tell us a little bit about your books and which one you would like to send people to? Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna read a book, read Knowing. Knowing is a compilation of the first two books. And I never had any intention of writing a book. Um, I was approached by a publisher at, gosh, it was 10 years after the accident. And uh, I said, no, no, I don't want anybody. I don't want to talk about this. I don't want people will think I'm crazy or they'll think I think I'm special or they'll be, you know, there was all kinds of um, what the ego was saying. I don't want to do this. But I actually went back to the scene of the accident. Um, and, and I asked, I, I prayed, I, I still pray. I said, look, and a publisher has approached me about writing a book. And I, I, I don't profess to talk to God every day, but I got an answer on that day. And it's that voice that speaks to the heart. But I was told, share your experience and others will heal. And suddenly I realized it has nothing to do with me. If, if it's about healing, it's about other people healing, because I had done a fair amount of healing over that decade. And, um, and so I, I wrote the book and, you know, the first book was, I knew their hearts and gosh, it did so well. The publisher wanted a second one right away. And I hurried and wrote beyond mile marker 80. I knew their hearts is the near death experience beyond mile marker 80 is the rebuilding of a life and putting together the pieces and falling in love again and all of that. But, but knowing the third book, knowing actually contains both of those books. It's the whole story. It's a personal memoir of, you know, gosh, what led up to the accident, the near-death experience, all that happened after. And it, it goes right on through raising the boys and the boys growing up and um, all the things that have happened. So if you're going to get one, get Knowing. It's available on Amazon in all formats. Just look up Knowing by Jeffrey Olson and you'll, you'll see it there on Amazon. Wow, that, that's great. And it's easy to find. So just check it out. Go to Amazon and it is in on Kindle. It's in paperback, hardcover. Is it on audiobook as well? It's not in Audible yet. I've got to get in the studio and read it. I, people keep telling me, you've got to get in here and get this book on Audible. And I that'll be the next step. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's easy to find it. So uh, everybody go check out his book. And now that you've been through this amazing healing journey, what do you think is the meaning of life? Oh, wow. You know, I, I, the, the purpose of life is to learn. It, we're simply here to learn. That, that's what was so beautiful in my experiences is the love, you know? And, 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 and there was no judgment of my life or anyone else's. In fact, as I judged my life, the creator said, that's your judgment of it, not ours. We love you. You're simply there to learn. And... Uh, and yet, what are we to learn? I, I feel we're here to learn to love. And perhaps the grandest love is self-love. We're here to learn to love ourselves, and therefore, we can love others in a more profound way. Beautiful. And how can people learn more about you? Do you have a website? I have a website. You can go to Envoy Publishing, E-N-V-O-Y Publishing. Envoy is French for messenger, but envoypublishing.com. And there's links there to the book. There's videos and YouTube things if you want to hear longer formats of the story and more details. Um, I offer some personal coaching. There's online workshops. There's a link there to something called the Spirit Keeper series, which after I had the near-death experience, gosh, I, I, I took a deep dive into my own religion. I took a deep dive into other religions. I looked at all kinds of healing modalities. And I found that indigenous spirituality, the, the thing, the people that were here first, um, I think they got it. They had so many beautiful traditions and keys that uh, I've, I've leaned into that as well. And that's, that's one of my favorite, what, spiritual practices of the time. But it's all on, at Envoy Publishing. You can find all of that there. 
So I'm going to be putting that in the in the podcast notes as well. So you'll have a link directly to his website, envoypublishing.com. And it's just been fascinating to have you as a guest today, Jeffrey. And if you could share a message with the listeners before we end this session, what would that be? Oh boy. You know, choose joy. Two words. <laughs> choose joy. And remember, it's a choice. You know, we may not control all the things that happen in our life, but we can certainly um, embrace how we experience them and ask, what am I learning from this instead of why me, you know? But uh, yeah, choose joy. Choose to be joyful and see the beauty around us and the little things. That would be, uh, that would be my message for anyone listening. Beautiful. Beautiful. You have been listening to the story of Jeffrey Olson's near-death experience. And to learn more about him, go to envoypublishing.com. So again, thank you, Jeff, so much for joining us today and sharing your journey with the listeners. Thank you, Dr. Latte. It's been a pleasure to be with you.